welcome back to Beholder to No One, a D&D podcast. I'm here today with a really good friend, Alex. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, you may recognize them from our Delta Green episodes, which got a lot of praise, actually. A lot of people seem to enjoy it. Yeah, it seemed I've, I've gotten a lot of similar feedback, also from our um, Honey Heist. Yes, you were also in Honey Heist, that is correct. I can't remember last week, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But yeah, that actually, now that I'm reminded, that game was really, really funny, and I'm still amused. And I love... I'm still gonna say this one. The only spoiler I'll say is I loved the minor Honey Heist slip-in into the Delta Green episode. And I was like, yes! That is perfect. It works perfectly, because, like, there's... The whole disinformation thing. It seems like the ideal story that would be on the headline of a tabloid. Exactly. And we're just, today we're going to talk about non, while we're a D&D podcast, technically, it's, we're also a tabletop game podcast. I don't just play D&D. I love a shit ton of tabletops, which is why we started Beholder to One Shot. And Alex is a huge fan of other systems. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Just random tabletop RPGs that we've tried and loved or didn't like or want to try or whatever. Yep. I think one that we should mention, even though we don't have a start date for it yet, is Vampire the Masquerade. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. We, we have things coming up. Super secret things. We have a super secret chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally what it's called, a super secret chat. <laughs> this, this is very true. It's Everybody is sworn to secrecy and has to uphold the masquerade. No, it's a fantastic game. I mean, we could definitely start there if you want to. Yeah. All right, sure. Basic overview. What is Vampire the Masquerade? Sure. So basic overview of Vampire the Masquerade is that you are a bunch of vampires, or as they call themselves in the game, kindred or canites, depending on which group you belong to. And you are in a coterie of vampires or group and you go around and do whatever it is you need to do in the city the biggest difference between this game and things like DD, as far as the flow and the play style is that vampire the masquerade is very very based on your connections with other people whether that's players or npcs or even just the city itself mm -hmm. and that's one of the major major aspects of it because combat as you will assume, or as you might have guessed, combat with vampires isn't exactly the most, you know, exciting thing ever. They kind of just, they're kind of just two glass cannons that swing really, really fast. One of them connects and then almost kills the other one. And that's usually how it happens. I think it's going to be an interesting game, especially if we go for more of a socialized roleplay version. I know that we haven't discussed specifically what we want yet from everybody in the group, but I know that we're going to obviously focus on role play which is new when i'm very used to like like you said D, D is very combat focused sometimes especially in my games that i run yeah actually um they're the thing with vampire the masquerade and what makes it so different from games like D D and things like that is that fact of what's the, the common thing that people say is that vampire the masquerade was what all the theater kids were playing when everybody else was playing D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. So it's very like, if you like those big dramatic characters and you like writing five page backstories for your character, that's really what it comes in or that will really put you in your element for Vampire the Masquerade because it is an entirely social and political game. You know, the things that you do, the people you meet, the deals you make, because you're dealing with absolute monsters. And in some situations, very, very powerful monsters. So having that ability to talk and work through things is kind of how you overcome your obstacles. Yeah, and if I understand correctly, there's also some sort of hierarchy as well. So you would need to be aware of that because you don't want to piss off the wrong person. Yeah, that is that is also a big difference between Vampire the Masquerade and other games is that personally, I would say session zeros are needed for any game just to put people on the same page. But they're really, really mandatory for Vampire the Masquerade because you need to have that talk with everybody of like, okay, you know, if you're new to the world or the world of darkness, this is what it's like. You know, if you're playing a character that has been a vampire for a while, you could also just play a character that just got embraced. And in that case, 
going in blind isn't necessarily a bad thing because then you'll run into people who tell you like, what are you doing? I think that's, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I think I played, is there a vampire video game? I think there is, isn't there? There is. There's Vampire Bloodlines, which came out in 2004. That game is a first person game where you can play as a few different clans and you just go through the game meeting people and accomplishing missions or just doing random things. But it's a very like tongue in cheek style of game, which in reality, vampire can be. It's not a doesn't have to be serious all the time. I mean, these are these are supposed to be kind of human things that live in modern day. So they would have to have some semblance of humor in order to blend in. Otherwise, they would stand out really bad. There's also our interactive storybook games that have come out more recently. Those are Vampire the Masquerade Coteries of New York and Vampire the Masquerade Shadows of New York are the two most recent. And then there's some other text-based games that are, I don't remember the name off the top of my head. I would have to pull them up. I think Shadows of New York is the one that I played. I remember distinctly playing a game, and I might be wrong. But I remember distinctly playing a game and it was exactly that. Like you were a new vampire and someone's like, what the hell do you think you're doing? Do you want to get yourself killed? Like that kind of thing. That was part of the tutorial. Yeah. I mean, if it was a first person game, it would probably be the old one. But if it was a storybook, then definitely it would be. But yeah, that's kind of a common that's kind of a common thing for vampire video games because it's the perfect way to intro to you into the game. It's like, oh, you don't need any backstory. It's like you're a new fledgling vampire. Here you go. Yeah, you just need to basically. Well, I guess you don't even know need to technically know who sired. Is that what it's called? That is correct. So the person who embraces you would be your sire. Typically, they're supposed to stick around because in Vampire, if your sire doesn't stick around and just ditches you, you don't really know what your powers are or anything else like that. So you kind of have to find that out as the story goes. Plus, Vampire culture, it's very commonly thought that if the person who sired you ditches, then they're kind of a piece of shit. (laughs) because <laughs> they see that as a uh, very big no-no to just so- embrace somebody and then leave. Yeah, maybe it was. Okay, I don't, it doesn't matter. I don't remember what game it was, but it, I remember it, 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 I enjoyed the beginning of it. That's what it was. But I think it would be an interesting story either way. I am excited because the only thing I do know is that I want to try the Nosferatu for that game, which previously I was very adamant to not play it but i've decided to like take it and make it my own instead of letting it have negative memories stuck in my head of exes <laughs> yeah i mean the wonderful thing about the vampires is that there is a very common a lot of times people will come up with a very common stereotype for a particular type of vampire or a particular clan but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to approach it that way the wonderful thing about nosferatu is that while one of their clan traits is the fact that they are made to look monstrous. There are so many other things like they're super strong. They're super good with tech. They're super sneaky. Like they have all these different things that they do that really expand their character. And plus like one of the biggest things in vampire and the Nosferatu are an excellent example of this is that when you make your character, you really make human you first and then you move into vampire you. And that's kind of how you make your backstory and who you are as a person. Because with the Nosferatu, it's possible that you were embraced because you're useful. It's also possible that you were embraced because you thought too much of yourself. You could be a person who's like, you know, I am the most beautiful person ever. Now, while that is a little bit darker of a storyline, that is actually a thing that is in the book. Is somebody targeted you because of how full of yourself you were and made you hideous by turning into a Nosferatu. Interesting. I love stories like that where it's just kind of like just a little bit. It's like it's fucked up, but it's a story. That's uh, that's very much vampire in general. Vampire in general is very it's fucked up, but it's still a story. <laughs> and we're going to have to, like I know that we're toning it down a smidge for podcast format, but we're, I think it's still going to be a lot of fun. And I'm very, very excited to actually play it. And I know that we're going to have a discussion soon about session zero. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the plan, just because we need to um, really to define the story of what the characters will do, because just to pull back the storyteller veil a little bit. When you make, they're called chronicles, when you make a chronicle for Vampire the Masquerade, usually set in a particular location, because unlike things like D&D, 
vampires don't really travel around all that much because there's a risk than them doing doing that. Like they can't be out in sunlight. Plus, if they just roll into somebody else's domain, they might be really hostile. Also, there's lots of things that want to kill them. So they kind of all stick in the same area. And so when you make your story, you say, okay, this is my area. This is going to be the major players in my area. So members of different clans and organizations. And then what you do with that is then you take the players in their session zero, you give them an intro to the world you've built, and then you allow them to build the party and what that story, how the story is going to be told. Right. Well, I am, like I already said, super excited, but there is dozens and dozens of other games. Mm -hmm. I know that recently we played Delta Green, which you are a huge fan of. Yes, it is easily in my top three games. I know that the first time we were discussing the concept of a fourth show for Beholder to No One, and it was like a mix between one shots, not quite a one shot, but not quite a campaign was the original idea. And we're like, oh, we'll start with Vampire, and then we'll go to Delta Green, and then we'll go to this game, and then we'll go to that game. I don't know if it's going to go that route. I don't know if we're just going to fall in love with Vampire and just continue Vampire forever and always. <laughs> it, it is very possible. A good example, and I mean, just obviously other shows that have done Vampire in the past, there are a lot of shows out there that really, you can dive really deep into Vampire. The thing about it is, though, and again, this comes with the fact that it's a very political, very social game, is that you can die very, very quickly, but that's usually because of a decision. So that makes it an excellent story point driver to the point where, like, you could make a city, you could have your coterie go through this whole thing, and maybe they join part of the Camarilla Court, maybe they become major players in the Anarchs or whatever else happens to them. And you can take that exact same story, take an exact, a new group of vampires and just throw them into the same exact thing. And your characters could still be in there, you know, make them be NPCs or whatever they, or they could be dead, throw them into this world. And it's that constantly changing and evolving story. But again, that's the difference between like vampire and something like D and D where your character and vampire, while they are very fleshed out, very detailed, very everything, their story is very compartmentalized. So, you know, if you're always going to be in the same city, chances are you're going to hear stories about the vampires in the past. That's really fun. Especially if you play long enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I think the LA by night is an excellent example of like, they get these characters that come in and they might just be people that appear one time or whatever else. And then they add to that story and they really, you know, because again, it's localized. So, if a person comes into your story, makes a big impact, that ripple effect is going to exist throughout the rest of your story. And it really makes it a really, really cool and really, really fun. And granted, that's not exclusive to just vampire. You could easily do that in any sort of game. Right. But vampire really lends itself to that style of gameplay and storytelling. I think any game with like a high risk of death, which seems to be the common theme for the games that you like, Yes, (laughs) Yes, because <laughs> <laughs> Delta Green also has a high risk of death as like which when you first explained it was like like Call of Cthulhu, but you are hired to do the job versus pushed into the position accidentally or by happenstance. Yeah, the description that I usually give people is if I can make the comparison, I'll say, have you ever seen season one of True Detective? Season one of True Detective is basically what you do, which is that. You are an eight. Well, you're all agents. That's what your characters are called thrown into the situation that you may not know everything about, but it's your job to take care of it, to clean it up, to make it go away, whatever else there might be. And that's really what it is from the gameplay perspective too, is in call of Cthulhu, you could be characters that have a job, but call of Cthulhu is kind of built on the piggyback of a bunch of, and this is just a, obviously a dumbed down version of it, but a bunch of archaeologists scooby doing their way around haunted mansions and things like that. Right. And Delta Green takes that same style of story, but then twists it in the way that you are now these group of people who you have a reason for being there. Your reason for being there is because it's your job. You have to take care of whatever there might be. And also there's a really high chance that you're just going to die because <laughs> some of the things you run into are really, really horrible. I kind of enjoyed the bits of suspense because it was very mundane at first, like very like agenty, just like, oh, I'm just here to do a job. And I think we've we talked about this offline before, but there's plenty of spaces where if this was a longer game, it could have been turned 
against us very quickly when we played Delta Green, just by the way how characters interacted with other NPCs or how we announced ourselves and things like that. And for my character, I was always kind of like on edge a little bit. Like, when is the thing happening? There's a thing. I know there's a thing. And I didn't interact with that way with Dr. Kamroth, but I myself was like, there's going to be a thing. <laughs> Some point. When is it going to pop out? <laughs> Look under the bed. Nope, it's alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things about Delta Green that makes it so unique and so cool is the fact that like, and it, I think that this goes for any game set in a modern setting, which is that there are real world consequences for doing things. So like, for example, in a game, if you have a character that just rolls in and starts interrogating people and they're like, I'm from the FBI or whatever else, or maybe somebody overhears your conversation and then passes that along to their friends, there are other groups of people working against you that can get that information and use it against you. And that's really one of the wonderful things about settings that are modern or and especially Delta Green is that the job that you're doing is supposed to be secretive. You're supposed to take care of it. You are brought in for a specific purpose. And usually if other people find out about it, it's bad. <laughs> so that really opens the door for you to make those situations. Like, for example, in our game, we had somebody who was talking a little bit too much to an old lady. She could have called the cops. Cops could have shown up. Cops could have done whatever. Cops could have hindered the story. And, you know, that really would open the door to making the agents be like, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of the situation? And, you know, that's one of the things I really like about games like Delta Green is that the consequences for doing things are very real. Mm -hmm. And plus, you're not a fantastical character. You're just some person and you may not even have a gun. Like Delta Green is not a combat game. Like granted, the bads can come out at any time. Like you could be a bunch of characters that are combat characters, but people that are veterans of Delta Green know that if I start you in a game, and I'm like, okay, you are members of your, it is like 1982 and set in the USSR. You are members of the, I think it's the SV8 group, which is the USSR version of the, of basically what Delta Green does. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you have AK-47s, you have RPGs, you have a flamethrower and veterans of the game will be like, oh, we're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm way too prepared. Because yeah. that means I'm underprepared. <laughs> yep, that is 100% what it is. Usually if you get more stuff, there is a very high risk. Or there could just be a high risk in general. <laughs> Recently in the Beholder to One Shot, we played Call of Cthulhu. And I played it for Four Corner Games on their podcast. And then at the end of that episode, I was like, I want to play this again, but for my show. And they're like, yeah, okay, that'd be cool. And so we continued with the same characters. So these characters were not agents. They were terrified. Uh, one was technically an agent, but it was not like for the, it wasn't for Delta Green. It was just they were looking for their their friend mm -hmm. who was also an agent. In the entire time, in the first game, my character was keeping a secret because it literally said was like, you cannot let them find out that you used to be a thief mm -hmm. or you used to steal a sell art on the black market like something like that mm -hmm. and so my character's reasonings for being there was she's like yeah i knew him but i i sold i sell antiquities what 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 do you think i am mm -hmm. but then she's like looking desperately like are there any notes with my name on it nope <laughs> nope okay we're good but then when we got to the second game because i refuse to say it on the actual recording mm -hmm. i told them afterwards not thinking about it and then at the second game they were like is there i was like is there anything look that looks expensive mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was funny and i i didn't own a gun but i stole the gun off of the dead fbi agent from the first story oh well, there you go and i got to use it <laughs> really good <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the things I love about, well, like Call of Cthulhu type games in general is just the hijinks that you get up to. And like, even though Delta Green is entirely people of, well, not entirely, but usually people from three letter organizations, there is that open opportunity for you to be like, you're just some, like, there's a scenario where you are just a bunch of contractors working on a house. And you may have ran into like maybe you looked inside of something you weren't supposed to look inside of and now the program knows about you and they're going to use that against you and all this other cool stuff and i think that's one of the things that really appeals to me with 
well, both Call of Cthulhu and Delta Green is the fact of like, you are a normal person and finding out how normal person would deal with this. Yeah. I My favorite games, other than like what we just were talking about, my favorite games that I love to dive into are post-apocalyptic games. Mm-hmm. Ones where it's like something bad has happened, but the earth is, or the planet or whatever, it doesn't have to even be on earth, it could be in space, is regrowing and rebranding and it's something completely different Mm -hmm. and there's some semblance of reality and then there's some or your prior our our reality that we know but there's also some semblance of like this new thing and i think that's why like i like games like shadow run and i enjoyed like mech warrior even though that was less Mm post-apocalyptic or i enjoyed the role or have you heard of them i think it's just the d20 systems but it's like modern and they have a post-apocalyptic a future one the cypher system no it's specifically like hold on i'll i'll google it (laughs) it's i think it's just like d20 modern oh yeah yeah there's um yeah they're they have a bunch of different games they ran they run in that i know they actually have a i think there was somebody who did a delta green game actually in d20 modern they have a D20 Apocalypse, which was fun. And we did a D20 Apocalypse one, I believe, once. And it was, oh, that was rough. That was that was uh, not safe for <laughs> podcast rough, but it was it was a lot of, like, it was a very intense, interesting game. But we went into it knowing that that was going to be an intense game. Mm-hmm. And those are the type of games that are just like, yes, let's play <laughs> that. But on the opposite end, I like, as I've talked about with you multiple times, I like the games where you build relationships and you build families and you build environments that you can survive in and like maybe not necessarily settle down but Mm -hmm. maybe eventually settle down and it's just fun to see what you can get from both sides of that whether in fantasy or post-apocalyptic or in space or Mm -hmm. whatever actually and you you mentioning that kind of makes me realize another thing about the games that we've mentioned so far is both of those things are very real aspects in both of these games, even so much as like you were talking about having a character that you care about. In Vampire, you have what are called touchstones, which are literally characters or things or whatever that mean a lot to you. Mm-hmm. And then usually they become targets or they can become targets. <laughs> and then I could see that. And then in Delta Green, you have your bonds, which are... And this isn't something we got to explore in the game, unfortunately, but actually in between missions, you're supposed to do vignettes. So like in Delta Green, if you see something really horrible and you fail your, uh, it's called sanity in the game where I like to use stress or stability. But if you fail on your stability role, maybe you take some points out of your relationship with, we'll say, your boss or something like that. And then in the vignette, maybe you talk to your boss and your boss is like, hey, how's it going? But then maybe you're just a little bit more short with your boss that time. So you have to like role play out why that happens. Exactly. And I think that that's one of the things that I really like about the games that we mentioned so far is the fact of like your characters feel a lot more real in the sense that usually things are not good all the time. (laughs) Most of the time there's bad. (laughs) That would have been really interesting with the character I was playing because I was we were all playing pre-gen characters I believe Mm -hmm. and I was playing Dr. Kamroth and her connections which I only mentioned one but hers were her sons and her church and I just thought of a perfect one if like you see something really messed up that you just go to church and go Like somebody mentions raise the dead. It's like, raise the dead. You don't want things raising from the dead. How dare you bring that up? And like freaking Mm -hmm. out in the middle of a sermon. And it just would be kind of funny to me. (laughs) Not only do you use content or trigger warning things in uh, real life, which I would advise. Oh, yeah, we should state that with all the games that we've mentioned so far. There are consent forms that get sent out so that nobody gets put in a really horrible situation yes. but you should do that with most games though oh yes like 100%. unless you're playing with people that you trust already and know like i play with friends and they all know not to bring certain things like dolls into the story yeah but when i play with strangers i'm just like yo heads up yeah this is very unlikely but please don't <laughs> yeah i would personally i put them in i would put them in every game that i run just because it's even something that can change with people. So like, and that's one of those things that a lot of people, maybe it gets brushed over is like, you could have a person who's like, yeah, I'm totally cool with witnessing somebody getting tortured. 
and then maybe they have a situation where they don't become cool with that anymore and like that's one of those things that i think it's becoming more more of a reality recently is having those safety tools built in Mm -hmm. and having that be the expectation which i think is wonderful and you know that's really something that i think will move rpgs forward is having that common common thought process I think what's funny is, like, I never thought of them as safety tools when they were being used previously to me understanding that that was a thing. Because I didn't un- I n- didn't hear the term safety tool until, like, the last year or so. Mm-hmm. And previous to that, it was just like, hey, can we just, can we skip past this part? Yeah. Or can we just, can we fade to black? Can, I'm not, I don't want to role play this out. And it was just like, yeah, okay. And people were cool with the table and like if there was ever doing something that somebody wasn't comfortable with it's like can can we not <laughs> yeah and it people would stop because it made somebody at the table uncomfortable yeah and that's something that a lot of people do too because the safety tools can pre- present themselves in different ways so kind of what you're talking about there's a system called the x card mm-hmm. which is literally everybody gets a card and if they're if a situation comes up that you're not comfortable with you put the card up and that's a signal to the dm okay move along you know no longer doing this thing Yeah, I like the um, red, yellow, green system Mm -hmm. that I heard from Victoria Rogers, I believe. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's who it was. She was in a... If it was not her, I deeply apologize. (laughs) But someone was in a video with Matt Mercer, I believe, and two of the McElroy brothers, and Austin, and think maybe brennan lee mulligan mm-hmm. but it was like there were six different there were six different storytellers and dms that are w- widely known or maybe it was Satine phoenix and they were talking about the red yellow green system which literally for their table was just you have three objects and i liked that system because it's not always a i need you to stop yeah sometimes it's a i need you to maybe veer away a little bit or tone it down Mm -hmm. but not necessarily stop. And then sometimes it's like you're having an emotional moment, but you're okay. Mm -hmm. Personally, your character is not okay. And then you do the green card and you're like, yeah, we can continue. It's fine. Yeah. I'm having, this is, this is the character. (laughs) Yeah. I think that, I think that that system, the red, yellow, green system, because what I've also seen is people will just take like a piece of paper and just tape it to the table and then you can tap whichever one you need to tap. I think that that works really well if you're going to be in a campaign setting. I think that the X card is more so born out of like one shots because yes, realistically right. you can just, you know, flash because what, that's one of the things that I look out for too when I run one shots is like, okay, I'm going to pick something that's not as graphic as I could be. And, you know, if somebody has an issue with it over, over Discord, it's a little bit more difficult, but I usually give people a, a safety word or something else like that that they can use. Banana hammock. I actually use hash browns is typically <laughs> mine. <laughs> oh, but hash browns is going to make you hungry. Yeah, but you know, it's fine. It's food. It makes That's you feel fair. a little bit better if you have to mention it. That's fair. Plus, it's crispy food. <laughs> but yes, it's... The next 20 minutes is about food. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. But I think it's one of those things that a lot of people, as of recent, are becoming more aware of. And especially since... RPGs have become a lot more progressive, a lot more inclusive, is people are a lot more, they look out for their friends and stuff like that a lot more in the games and make sure everybody's okay because, like, this is an escape for for us and you don't need to be in a situation that makes you feel uncomfortable if you're trying to have an escape. But at the same time, it also allows you to work through really difficult things if you want to. And I think that that's one of the most wonderful things about RPGs is that, like, even from the basis of myself, if I have a situation where i have a really like a nightmare that really bothers me like for whatever reason because it's just it's it's a reality Mm -hmm. i will take that nightmare and i will usually if it's something i'm like i could turn this into a story i actually usually write it down or have take note of it somewhere and then i'm like i'm gonna make like a call of cthulhu or delta green game based around this i can't do that because i don't i very rarely remember my nightmares but when i do they're just super odd and confusing like i had one i think the other day where i couldn't find my husband but i could find everybody else that i worked with at every point in my life and like friends that i've never physically seen and like old high school bullies and then i'm just like i just want my husband and then it's like i found divorce papers or something and then i woke up and i woke my husband up and was like we didn't get divorced right (laughs) 
<laughs> and he's like, no. I'm like, okay, cool. And then I went back to sleep. <laughs> and that was the end of the story. <laughs> but it was just like, those are those are like the nightmares I remember. The ones that are just so fucking ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I did remember like one good dream recently, but it wasn't like something I could use. But it literally was just that I saw my grandfather and he said he was proud of me. And I was just very happy with that dream. Oh, that's wonderful. I was like, thanks. I miss you. And that was it. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I remembering my dreams is more I for a long period of time. I didn't. And then for some reason, I just started remembering them again. But it's uh, I usually have nightmares, which is not very fun, but it is what it is. So <laughs> I don't envy you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So what other systems do you like? You said that Delta Green was in your top three. Mm -hmm. Was Warhammer one of them? Actually, so that's actually something that I, my first foray into RPGs in general, which is kind of funny. When I started this, started playing games, I started, it was in high school, and I started with Warhammer 40,000 Dark Heresy. So I didn't even play D&D until way later in my RPG life. It's one of those things that I've I've been a fan of Warhammer 40k for a long time. And while I more recently don't play much of the tabletop, the stories that you can tell in the worlds and things like that are really fun and really cool. So I've been delving into their more recent releases, which is uh, they have the system Wrath and Glory, which is from Cubicle 7. Cubicle 7 also has other warhammer related titles they have the age of sigmar one which is more that's more of like big fantasy characters like legendary heroes and stuff like that and that's what you play and then you fight gods and hordes of monsters and everything else so that's more of what the age of sigmar game has to offer and then there's also the warhammer fantasy rpg which right now is in its fourth iteration that's also released by cubicle seven and in that one, you are just normal humans, or if you roll, you could also become a non-human. But that the thing that makes that type of game unique is you can literally take a D100 and roll your way through character creation. You might end up with a, you know, a guy who is a dung collector for his job and can't speak common and all this other stuff, but you know, that will be your randomly Oh, and you could also be 80, and that will be your randomly generated character. And which one was that? That is Warhammer Fantasy, mm. and that's by Cubicle Seven. Wasn't Zweihander like that? Zweihander like that as well? So yeah, actually, Zweihander is really why Fourth Edition came out because Zweihander brought back that brought back that older style of game because Zweihander is supposed to take sick, and it's not directly the creator of this didn't directly say this, but the idea is that. You take the things that are established in Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition, which is regarded as one of the best editions, and then streamlined it, and that's what Zweihander became. But Zweihander has a lot of these other OSR elements or old-school revival elements to it that make it unique and interesting. And it's also a sandbox setting, so you can just throw anything you want into it. So while Zweihander out of the box is made for this low, dark fantasy, there's also, like they just made a new one, Flames of Freedom. So a more recent title that they are really, well, they just finished the Kickstarter a few months ago is Flames of Freedom, which is taking the Spyhander setting, or the, I'm sorry, the Spyhander rule set, and then put it into a setting of like this dark Gothic American setting set in like the, or the late 1700s. And one of the things that's really cool about Spyhander is that they are very inclusive with the characters and character creation and everything else like that. There's not a binary gender system. There's not really anything like that. It's all, you can be whoever you want to be, and that's totally fine in the story. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I am excited to try that game soon, and it is going to be in the docket in about three one-shots from now. Yes, it should be very good. It, it can be a really, really cool setting but I will warn people that it is also very punishing because <laughs> there's not really a good healing method. So if you get your arm chopped off, your character now doesn't have an arm. I actually, um, in D&D, we used, uh, I know that we're talking about TTRPGs in general, but 
uh, we use this deck of critical fails and critical successes. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to buy them again, but also like I, I didn't own them. So I would kind of want to buy them for myself, but also they were like ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I got critically, my character got critically hit and we pulled a card and it basically says, was it melee ranged or magic? And if it was melee, it's like roll a D4 okay you lose your right arm yeah and i'm like but 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 that's my sword arm <laughs> you can't just take my right arm <laughs> and i but I, was, but I really liked the idea of that because it made sense and and i've used in games previously when resurrection happened that there were consequences to resurrection it wasn't just you're resurrected and you're back to 100 percent. however you died in game is going to have a consequence. So like if you died, my character died from Cone of Cold. So she came back with a vulnerability to cold damage and she constantly felt like she had pneumonia, which was more flavor because they didn't want to give me like a negative to con or anything. But other players, they died because they had their arm chopped off. So then they had to, they came back without an arm. And it was just always thematic to how you died one character that i ran a game for he died because he rushed off he got mad and rushed off and went and fought a, a party that was too big for him to fight and then he got killed because instead of running away he ran up slashed him and then left and got critted so when he was resurrected his fear was being alone and he that was his his negative to the resurrection. So he had kind of like a PTSD almost. Mm -hmm. And the negative was that he would have panic. He had to roll a wisdom save if he was ever alone or could not see his allies. And if he rolled below a 10, I think it was, he started to panic where he would have like disadvantages but he would still be able to take his turn but if he rolled a natural one he went full-blown panic and he mm -hmm. could not take his turn until somebody calmed him down mm. and it was interesting like we agreed upon it like we discussed the mechanics so it wasn't just like here here's your new thing mm -hmm. and we discussed it and i based it off my personal experiences with panic attacks and anxiety and i'm like is this okay with you? And he's like, that sounds legit. Like that makes perfect sense for the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of those things that I really think. And, and this is becoming more of a thing more recently is I really enjoy games with downsides basically. Well, not, I mean, having PTSD isn't necessarily like a flaw or a downside, but having those, like you can do this thing, but it comes with this string attached sort of thing to mm -hmm. it. Because I think that that's a lot more of a real scenario. And that's one of the things that I enjoy, like in um, most of the fantasy gaming that I've done is through Pathfinder. And in Pathfinder, you actually have a class that is the Oracle. Mm -hmm. And the Oracles, their thing is that they are just humans who, or whatever, whatever community they come from, who happen to be kind of like a, mal a connection to a particular god. It may not have even been a thing that they wanted, but that connection brings with it a downside of some sort. So, like, I had a character who he was a oracle of me of metal, I believe, so that he could like wear heavy armor all the time and sleep in it and be totally fine. But one of the downsides of him was that when he got into combat, he would no longer be able to speak common he would only be able to speak in abyssal hmm. so he would start speaking this really monstrous language and it would be there for hours afterwards and it was something i created and i brought it to my gm and then my gm started putting in monsters that respond to me and it really opened up this pathway to make it a really really cool interaction but i think more more to the point i think that having those flaws makes the characters more relatable just the same as having a villain that has positive things about them because Skeletor style villains are great, but in some situations like a uh, vampire or in a game where you want the villain to have more depth and more character, 
having relatable aspects to them makes it a lot makes the moral your you know the moral decisions that you have to make a little bit more difficult right because like you could have a you could have a villain who's like you know going out and stealing all this stuff or like putting these people to the sword and to get all this money and everything else but they could be using that money to pay somebody to resurrect their dead brother or to keep their family alive or any other number of things and making these decisions much more difficult for the players and i think that like adding those relatable elements to the story makes it a lot more engaging because i'm i mean i love a good saturday morning rpg all the and you know that's fun to play in but i myself for running them i prefer games where i can make these really deep i like making characters that are very deep or very relatable and making it more difficult for players to make easy decisions when it comes to how they interact with them. Yeah, and I like playing in games where you have to make a moral decision to mm-hmm. and that it mess like you have to like you know what's right and wrong, but you also are like if I do the right thing, my wife whole life will change. Mm-hmm. For the worst. And you have to make that decision. So, like, I've had to do that a couple of times with characters. And there have been times where my characters had, like, I've actually retired characters in games because the party was going a route that my character would not have gone. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it makes the story more fun and interesting when you, not necessarily, like, it's what my character would do type of concept. But, yes, it's, like, if you're playing a fully evil party or if you were playing like a chaotic neutral and then you were just kind of like, eh, you were neutral good, maybe, let's say. Mm-hmm. And y'all get along, you're doing your thing, but then you, you, get, you didn't have to murder that entire goblin family. Like, why, why did you murder the entire goblin? Well, I wanted their money. <laughs> well, uh, well, let's, let's just not let's do it again. And then like the next town over... You did it again. You, mm-hmm. you, why, why are you murder hoboing, basically? And eventually you get to a point where it's like, I don't want to be associated with this. Because mm-hmm. you hear, oh, that's the group that just goes and kills people. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's that's one of those things that I myself don't, I try to steer away from is those murder hoboing party systems. And it, even, I'm uh, I'm admittedly a little bit more vindictive with it when I play in games. Because if somebody doesn't tell me that that's their intention beforehand and they just try to do it, I'll be like, okay. Like, if I run a one-shot of Delta Green, I'll be like, okay, sure, whatever. And then this person will be like, I'm going to go attack this monster that I see. I'm like, okay, cool. It's a it's a Shuggoth. It's, uh, it's a basically living bulldozer. So you're going to use your 9 millimeter pistol on it? Yeah, go for it. Okay, it gets to you, and it eats you. So I will... <laughs> like, I have played... And do play sometimes murder hobos, so I'm mm-hmm. not saying anything technically against it, like as long as everybody's okay with it. Yeah. But just like if your character doesn't fit with that. But yes, yeah. if you you need to be like aware of it in session zero type thing. Cause yeah. there are situations where murder hoboing isn't gonna be the answer. Right. Maybe you need to talk this one out. <laughs> Yeah, and that's exactly it. It just comes down to having that discussion in session zero. Because again, there's not like murder hoboing has a very negative connotation with it. But I mean, in reality, if that's the type of character that you want to play, and if that's the type of character that the party wants to have with them, then cool. Maybe they have this really cutthroat character that they constantly have to watch out for. And maybe it gets them into more, you know, difficult binds in the story or whatever else. And, you know, as long as everybody's on the same page and it's not, and I think that's what it comes down to is that you don't want something that is ruining everybody else's good time. And a perfect example, I think of that would be like in the vampire, the masquerade game. I'm pretty sure if you just went around killing people, you would get noticed and they'd be like, yo, you, you would probably be dead within the first day or two. Yeah. It's like, you're drawing attention to us. <laughs> That's yeah. not okay. <laughs> it's it's one of those things that in modern Vampire the Masquerade is a more recent development. It's the fact of like the masquerade is important to uphold because you know it it makes it so the humans don't know about you. And the reason why it's bad for the humans to know about you is number one, they could talk, so another vampire could find you, or any other number of things that are out there that could kill you. 
Or there's also the Second Inquisition, which is just a bunch of human vampire hunters that could be like, did you say there was a vampire? And then you wake up and you're looking at a sunrise and you die. Or they just light you on fire. Any other number of things. Because you're not supposed... Like, the world of Vampire the Masquerade is our world. It's just a little bit darker. So people aren't supposed to know that these things exist. They'll see the movies and stuff like that. And there's also that element of, like, maybe the vampires are the one who made the movie. So you have this, you know, this misdirection and be like, oh, yeah, you know, we're all... We sparkle when we get in the sun, and we just want to love people. When in reality, if Edward was in Vampire the Masquerade, he probably would have eaten Bella on like four different occasions. <laughs> it wouldn't have even gotten to the hello, my name is. Just been like, ooh, food. Yeah, there is a, there's a Vampire the Masquerade story where that happens, actually. There's a character who, she is a Tremere, or I'm sorry, she is a Toreador. And, hey, um, the one I know. Yes. <laughs> So the character is a Toreador, and she meets another character. And this other character in the story is very big into art and singing and things like that. And this Toreador becomes infatuated with them because the Toreadors love art and they love beauty and all these other things. So they become almost drunk off of it. Mm -hmm. And what happens is eventually the story gets to the point where the characters are together and they're like, oh, it's going to be this really passionate scene. But then the main character just loses it because of course they do. And they just devour this person. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. And that's, that is straight up. A, and that is a very real thing that can happen in the game too. Cause like you could be performing a normal task and because of the hunger mechanic, you could roll your dice and be like, I'm going to use my power to make this guy believe like, you know, to change this guy's mind. So he'll let me pass. I'm like, Oh, and you could be like, okay, go ahead and roll your dice. And you have to include your hunger dice. Cause that's an aspect of the game. And you could get a messy failure or a messy critical because of the hunger dice. And it'll be like, okay, you try to change the person's mind. And then you just bite down on them <laughs> in the middle of this thing. Because like one of the differences with, with the vampire, the masquerade versus other stories that, the vampires aren't always in control. Like the car the person isn't always in control. Mm -hmm. There's also this deep thing inside of them called the beast. And the beast is really what you are. It is the monster that you are. You as a person is just holding that back. So there are times when it just comes out and just does whatever it wants, because it's like, I am an apex predator and I'm just going to eat this thing or kill this thing or any other number of things. Have you read the Dresden files? I have. I like how Jim Butcher did the vampires in his story mm -hmm. because there are three different types and each type feeds a different way and i love that concept because it kind of took and i'm sure he's not the one that came up with this i'm sure it's been done previous to that but it's the first time i had seen it but like there's one family of vampires that feeds off basically sexual desire and that's yeah, the what they court. Yes, the white court. So that's what they do. And they don't hurt anybody. They never hurt anybody. They might, they might like overdo it a little bit, but then they take care of them and they make sure to like be sure that they're the people they feed off of are taken care of and treated well. And then they have these big parties. And, and it's just, it was a very interesting twist on it where mm -hmm. the red court did other things and the black court did something completely different. Mm -hmm. And it was just really interesting. And I liked seeing or being reminded of the like the rules and like how political vampires are mm -hmm. like they have certain rules that they have to abide by. And that if you break, they will do whatever it takes for you to break that rule first so that you're to blame and they're scot free. Yeah. But, but yeah. That that is also something that carries through in this game, too, is the fact of like because there's these these vampiric governing bodies they could just you could do something that could piss off the wrong person and then now there's a blood hunt called for you which is basically the authorized killing of another vampire mm. because it's actually illegal and for most of the most of the groups but there'll be these things that really drive that forward because in reality like they are horrible monsters that could just kill anything so having that political aspect to them and having that social aspect to them is what really what drives them forward and also keeps them safe. <laughs> yeah, very true. 
I imagine like the first vampire that was ever in existence is just like, you know what? I need to put some laws down so things don't get out of hand. Because this is, I don't want to just release a bunch of me's out there <laughs> without rules. Funny enough, that's pretty much how the Vampire the Masquerade story goes. Yes. <laughs> to give to give you a little bit. So the first vampire ever is Cain. So the Cain the events of Cain and Abel happen, but instead of God punishing Cain, Cain but God instead is like, all right, I'm gonna make you into this super fast person who could do all this other stuff and like it's it, the form of punishment is basically you get to live forever and watch all the people you care about die and they're gonna think you're a monster now which is you know it makes sense why that would be a punishment but then Cain went and started embracing uh the antediluvians and these other people and the antediluvians are really when you start seeing this well it, in the 1400s is when you start seeing these forming of these vampires into group governing groups because mm -hmm. prior to that they just kind of did whatever they want and then what that resulted in is like other, chaos. other vampires. Yeah. Well, other vampires trying to attack them, but also the original inquisition just being like, well, time to kill everything. Yeah. Also, they just run into like werewolves and other things. And granted werewolves, like they don't actively, they, they do hate vampires for the most part, but they're not like their mortal enemy that they always seek out. They're too busy trying to kill things that are killing the earth. Another good series is the Mercy Thompson series because mm -hmm. they play on vampires, werewolves, and fae. And mm -hmm. they show the political systems of all of them throughout the stories. Mm -hmm. It's just really interesting because, like, in the, like, you see the werewolf society the most at the beginning. You see the alpha and what happens when there's two alphas nearby mm -hmm. and how they make that work because of a particular situation. And it was really... Like, those type of things always fascinate me. And then when you get into, the, like, fae culture as well, it's, like, the, the trope of never trust the fae or they'll always, they'll tell you a lie, but it's technically mm -hmm. the truth. And they're just, it's always been super fascinating. And I'm terrified, but also intrigued. And I know that if I played a character that dealt with something like that, I'd be the first person to fuck up because I'd just be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. And then like, oh shit, wait, hold on. I was supposed to say that. And they're or they're like, hey, what's your name? Oh, my name is oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Usually the Fae are pretty awful in most stories. <laughs> like they are very, very powerful, but they also like for the most part don't really care about humans all that much or the interaction that they have with them. So they just kind of like if they mess you up, it's like, whatever. We don't care. You're just this stupid little man thing. Yeah, that's fair. I know that. It depends on what system you're playing it. Are there any other systems that you really like? Because I know we mentioned one of your top three, right? Yeah, so actually, I mean, we my top three in reality, and I think we've actually gone over them at this point, are Vampire and, well, World of Darkness in general, which there's a lot of stuff that can go into that. Delta Green, and then probably the Warhammer 40k games. <laughs> Honestly, my top three, just because, like, I and it's the dark theme is very true throughout all of them but i i have so many games that i just love and it's one of the things that i always really enjoy is looking through the new game and like finding out what's cool even if i don't really like it all that much i'll delve into it and it's actually one of the things i was going to say is you were mentioning earlier about you like stories where it's a post-apocalyptic it's this world that was and the interaction with it there's actually a game called numenera which is precisely that. <laughs> and it uses the Cypher system, which is a D20 system. And I think it has D6s in it too. And what it is, is you are a bunch of characters in this fantasy world where multiple apocalypses <laughs> have happened. And you find this ancient dead technology, which is like the Cyphers and things like that. And they may be, they may not even do anything. You might find this crystal that breaks apart and reforms itself constantly. It really doesn't do much. And you really don't know what it does but it's a piece to another machine and like you're building this world around you and everything else like that. And one of the fun things about the game is like, instead of giving you magic items, they give you these cipher pieces and it might be like, all right, I pick up this thing and it shoots out the flame, but it does that one time. And then after that, it is no longer useful. I've heard of the cipher system, I think, because I think that's what into the motherlands uses mm -hmm. the, the system that I want to 
there's two systems that I want to try a little bit more. Well, one is I do want to try the Cypher system because I haven't played with that yet. I want to try the Into the Flood system. I've only played it yes. once. Maybe yes. twice. The, the, um, I can't remember what the name of their uh, overarching sto- zero system. Engine. Zero engine. Zero, year zero engine. That's zero. right. Or is it year zero, zero year? I think it's year zero. Year zero sounds right. So yep. it's, yeah, it's one of those things that I I picked up stories from the flood or tales from the flood. I think it's tales from. The- I know there's tales from the loop and then the stories from the flood. I picked up the stories from the flood one just because I thought it would be kind of cool, because it has this kind of and I think things from the loop. Things from the flood. Oh, a okay. session of tales from the flood. Tales from the All flood. That's what it is. Yeah. There you go. So. It has kind of this Goonies element to it, mm-hmm. which is fun to me. And I really want to try it at some point, but I haven't I haven't gotten the time to crack it open yet. It's on my long list of to read. That's the system well, a there I don't know the terminology, but they basically let you use their system for free to make your own like version. Oh, sandbox systems. Well, I'm sure there's a better name for open it, but source. that's open source, yes. So GM table, they use that system, but they use like a rules light version that is Mm -hmm. slightly different. And that's where I heard about it. And I Mm -hmm. played in a one shot for charity with them where we did Strahd 87, where we were Mm -hmm. in 1987 Miami for spring break. And we ran into Strahd in a club (laughs) wearing a white suit. The power (laughs) of... It was a really interesting game, and I really liked the system mechanics. But the other system that I want to get to know a little bit better, other than like Savage Worlds, which I'm going to start playing soon again, is Power by the Apocalypse. Yes. They've only played it once or twice as well. And I like the concept of the fail uh, kind of or mixed success and then success. And mm-hmm. I liked the concept of with Monster of the Week, for example, that you come up with the spells. And it's never like you can do anything pretty much with magic specifically, mm-hmm. but you still have to roll for it. And then you have to come up with the description. Yeah. And that fascinates me. And Savage Worlds does that too. You have a ton of spells, but what it does is up to you. Like bolts can be lightning, fire, acid, what kind of bolts? It's up to you. Mm-hmm. Healing can be a band aid. It could be holy symbol, like a med kit. Like it's your decision. Mm-hmm. And I like the customization of that. Where in D and D, it's like, oh, firebolt's its own thing, and then you have to take frost. Frost ray, ray of frost. Ray of frost, yes. Because I never take that one. <laughs> but like you're limited to like that one spell, and it's just kind of like but I want to do something different. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And the one thing I will say, just really quick, Mm -hmm. give bards more fucking cantrips. For the (laughs) love of God, vicious mockery. I'm so tired of it. Please. (laughs) Okay, I'm done. No, it's fine. I totally agree with you. I mean, in reality, that's one of the things that makes stuff like Powered by the Apocalypse so cool is and a lot of other games too is they're they're heavy lean into that descriptive rp more than you know rules and dice rolls and things like that i think that's something that really appeals to me personally which is why i like the games that i do not to say that i dislike D or anything else D is no. fun but i i tend to like the more story driven things than i do the more roll dice to achieve things I mean, I play D and D more fifth edition more than anything else. Mm-hmm. I love the system, and I love a lot of things about it. I I don't like some things about it too. I just also want to try all of the things, and unfortunately, there aren't as many people who want to try all of the things. Mm-hmm. So that's why, like, when I did the Beholder to One Shot, it was literally just because I'm like, I want to play. All these games, but I have no one to play with. And there's only so many times I can force Ashley, Greg, and Keith to play a game with me. Yeah. I mean, that that is one of the beautiful things about 
like tabletop RPGs in general, and especially the public realms that we find ourselves in where we can like even going to drive through, you could go to the top 10 list and look through and be like, I want to play all of these games and they're easily accessible. And you know, the one beautiful thing about Beholder to One Shot is that we could take Cyberpunk, for example, which has been on the top of five of the list for forever and run that. And it works really well for one shots and people can easily find it. And I mean, like that personally is one of the things that I do is I always go through things on social media and go through drive through and look for like what's on itch what's on drive through what's the new thing that's coming out even though reality is that i probably will never be able to run them because i really only can feasibly handle five games at once but you know i have a large what? collection and i love learning about new things <laughs> Only five that's amateurs let's go 15 <laughs> i mean i think in total i have I probably have 30 core books at this point. That's absurd. <laughs> Not physically. Physically, I have one Kellex shelf of books. Hold on. I don't have all my stuff downloaded. <laughs> <laughs> but I have 29 items in my Beholder to No One Games folder. <laughs> Nice. Most of those came from you <laughs> or <laughs> buying them off of quite a few of them are also from Joel Salda's stuff <laughs> like Lude Grandies and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then some Savage Worlds and then some Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's not a bad thing, really, because it what it allows you to do is even if I only run five games on a con if even if I only feel comfortable with running five games on a consistent basis, I can read through these other things and be like, oh, I really like that. And I can because rule books are suggestions. You could find something in another game and be like, this is really cool with the way that they deal with this. I'm going to import that into this game and make it so it's a lot, you know, a lot more interactive and a lot more fun. And nobody's going to care reality. Like if you are playing to have fun and unless you are supposed to be playing the rules to that game if it makes a better story then go for it yeah i've been really liking the one page stuff lately or like the smaller i think mm -hmm. they're called signs or zines zines like lewd grannies was one of them honey heist was another one that was just really funny and it was just it's a it's one page and you don't need to know a lot about it there was one that i played and i won't say much about it because it's not out but I DM'd a game called Rainbow Island, mm -hmm. which was super fun. And that's also, it wasn't a one pager, but it easily could have been a one pager. Mm -hmm. One game I do want to try is Tavern at the End of the World. And that's a one pager. Okay. And like, there's so many, like, just like, I have so many games. And then like, I bought games mm -hmm. like, I don't think I'll ever try like X Nova and Beak Feather and Bone that I purposely bought because I was looking for systems that did like the town building aspect that I wanted. But when I started reading them, I got really confused. And then I realized that nobody will ever want to play these with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned. <laughs> it is, it is one of the unfortunate realities, which is the beautiful thing. If you can find games that have quick starts is you can take, you know, a night read through the quick start and be like, I probably won't like this. And, or I do like this or any other number of things. And it's, I, I also, I would have to agree, I really do enjoy the one-page RPGs because the unique thing I find with the one-pagers is it gets people to make really, really interesting characters and really, really interesting decisions because there's not that much to it mm -hmm. as far as the rules go to determine who you are as a person or things that you have to remember. Like, in Honey Heist, there's two stats. And, yeah. like, it allowed people to be like, I know exactly what I'm doing, and then just go in and be a bear and have fun and that's one of the things I really, really like about those one page RPGs and is that they open open that up for people. That's why I like one shots too, because you can just make ridiculous characters and it is just a blast. Oh yeah. You have no you don't care. You can just throw everything at it because mm -hmm. you're never playing this character again. Exactly. And that's why stuff like I, I also I'm a huge fan of one shots and it's why I like Delta Green so much is because I can literally just walk in with that game. And be like, oh, this is your first time playing? That's fine. Sit down. Yeah, I will tell you what to do. And just they'll be like, well, don't I have to know about the story? Not really. You could just be an agent who's done this for the first time. Congratulations. You're you. Yeah, pretty much. 
Yeah, but it's at the same time though, I, I say that I like games that can be turned into one shots, but Vampire one hundred percent cannot. <laughs> you need a happy balance. You need the games that are longer where you can get connected to your character and get connected to the story and you feel the emotions and you're just like, Don't you fucking dare kill my character. I will, <laughs> I will find you. Don't know no, don't make her cry. I what are you doing? <laughs> and there's characters where you're like, she runs in full guns blazing and just like shoots everything, much to a particular listener's disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, it is always good to have that balance of, you know, and it's, I'm now realizing one of those things I'll have to have a discussion with people on is, you know, fall in love with your character, sure, but don't be reckless. Because they could die. <laughs> I'm gonna be like the most cautious, most cautious vampire ever. I'm never leaving my house. I'm going to do everything remotely, and I'm just gonna send people text messages and be like, "Go in here." I mean, that is straight up a character in vamp- in the uh, video game from 2004. <laughs> he just sends he sends his ghouls to go do things. But the downside is that you'll starve to death and then you'll go into torpor and then you'll be asleep for an extended period of time until somebody wakes you up. <laughs> I'm sure there's a blood dash somewhere and I'm happy to deliver it to my house. <laughs> Depends on if you can eat bagged blood because <laughs> it's not a thing that they all can do. No, the delivery driver is the... Oh, is I see. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, they go, through, they go through them really quickly. It's really weird. <laughs> Turnover rate is atrocious. I like it. I I had a character who I was brainstorming a thing and we made an only fangs where vampires would use the internet to look for because it is it is actually a thing in the game that like you're not always just planning on assaulting people you will find like there are straight up vampires that the way that they have to feed is from consenting individuals so yeah. you'll have a person who you'll be like listen I have this blood condition and I, I just need to like get some blood from you but it has to go into my mouth you know I promise it'll be okay and you'll be okay after is that okay with you and as long as a person agrees, you can drink from them, get sustenance. But if they don't, and you are a character that specifically has to drink from people that consent, you don't get anything. <laughs> You're just like, shit. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. I You're mean, not worth my time. Next person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rinse and repeat until you get someone to say, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, like, if you think about it, it wouldn't be that weird. There would be people that would be cool with it. Yeah. And I think that that's one of those things that is in the storybook game that is so real is like when you meet your character for the first time, you're like, okay, well, you look really hungry, which means that you have to go feed and you go meet this person who's like fully aware of everything that's going on. And because one of the interesting aspects of it is for most vampires, when they feed on somebody, the actual feeding releases a chemical inside of them that is very like a very what is the best word for it a feeling of euphoric not so much euphoric it's like a feeling of ecstasy and ple- overwhelming pleasure and things like that to the point where they may actually seek it out if they remember that it's happened mm. interesting very very interesting mm-hmm. i am so excited to try my <laughs> again it, it should be good you also will run into the characters, though, that that's a thing, and then you have to stop yourself from killing them, because the only way to get rid of all of your hunger and vampire is you have to kill them. Interesting. hmm <laughs> I'm going to have some predicaments, probably. Oh, yes, I, I suspect so. <laughs> but that's okay. I'll get through it somehow. So, I think like, we've talked a lot, which is great, and this has been a blast. Yeah, but seemingly some some on topic things. We have been on topic <laughs> the entire time. Thank you very much. <laughs> I am very proud of us. As am I. Half of the times that we're supposed to talk about stuff, we're like, okay, we're going to talk about vampire, and then I just bitch for thirty minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Venting is important too. Uh, so tell the fine folks where they can find you if you would like. Sure. So you can find me on most social media outlets. Um, my name is at Alex the DM89. That's at A L E X T H E D M89. I mostly just post random stuff about things that I acquire, or I repost a lot of other creators just because I like to find people that I enjoy and then blast their stuff out so everybody else can find the cool things. Yeah. 
and soon you will find them here mm -hmm. on a particular day of the week that has not yet been decided at a particular release date that has also not yet been decided. Undisclosed location, time, and date. Yes. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining. Yes, thank you for having me. This is wonderful. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Please go give Alex a like on or a follow on Twitter. Also, you can find me on Twitter at Beholder to No One. And you could look on Facebook, but I'm not going to technically be there. So it's not really a point to go follow that. But if you want to give it a like, you can. You can find all of you can find us wherever podcasts can be found. And if you don't like discussions, well, thanks for listening to this one. If you did like discussions, we have a crap ton more that you can go listen to. Or if you want to listen to some of those one shots we mentioned, I have about 15 out currently that you could go enjoy. We also have an actual play that just released episode 13 called Behold Clear Light, a horror-esque D&D 5th edition actual play. And things are getting real. Real. Really real. Very real. That's all I'm going to say. Episode 15. Whew, the freaking cliffhangers. No spoilers, though. So come see us again, and thanks for joining. Bye! Bye!